Welcome to Small Pleasures, a podcast that discusses great short stories and greatness in the short story form. My name is Livy Michael and I'm a novelist and short story writer from Manchester, England. And this is Sonia Moore, a short story writer and translator from Paris, France. Bonjour. We've come together because of a mutual enthusiasm for the short story, although I think our responses and what we want from a short story vary, and we hope that the differences will provide a fruitful discussion. In this podcast, we're discussing the title story from the collection The Dead Girls Class Trip by the German writer Anna Segers, published by NYRB Classics, May 2021. It is the title story of the collection, what would you say it was about? In terms of plot, it's quite difficult to describe. We have the main protagonist, a young girl called Nettie, who travels back in time to yes. a class day trip in which she meets her old best friends and many of her old fellows and many of the old comrades from her old town. And we discover what happened to each person and how they acted in the course of the First World War and the Second World War uh, and the Spanish Civil War. And there's an attempted homecoming, but the story ends with with a return to where it started out in, in Mexico, where the protagonist was recovering from a fever. I think you're right in saying it is really quite difficult to describe in terms of plot. Interesting as well that it ends with her actually beginning to write the story. So in a sense, it comes full circle. It's a substantial short story. And one of the things that I think is relevant to her writing is her own lifetime, because The Dead Girl's Class Trip was apparently the only autobiographical thing she wrote. So it is generally relevant to mention the details of her life. She was born in Germany in 1900 and lived until 1983, which means that she lived through some of these cataclysmic changes affecting Germany and indeed the rest of the world. And she fled Nazi Germany and lived in several different places in Europe and also in South America and in the Caribbean. And her stories cover this huge arc, this span of Eastern in Western Europe, the Caribbean, Mexico and China. In that sense, the body of her work has a, an epic scope. And I think that's one of the reasons why she was nominated for the Nobel Prize in 1967. For that reason, and because there is always a political engagement in the work. I seem to remember you saying that her work was consciously epic. Is that right? Or is it perhaps this story... I think throughout her work, there is this kind of ongoing project of trying to find the right form to encompass these massive experiences that she lived through. I mean, the longer I live, the more I consider that everyone's life has an epic quality. You know, we're all born into the world. We all experience birth, love, death in one form or another. And we live through massive political changes wherever you are in the world. But I think it's perhaps not as usual to be so directly caught up in them as Anna Segers was, having to flee Germany, being arrested at one point because of her anti-Nazi work, and her husband was arrested because he was a communist. She joined the Communist Party. She was leader of the Writers' Union in the GDR. So I think there is this breadth of human experience that she is seeking to encompass, but also to try and find an artistic form that does that justice. Because if you think of it, that span of life and the number of countries, you could write about 50 novels about it. The more I think about it, the more I think it's exceptional to choose the short story, although she wrote novels as well, to choose the short story as a form of encompassing this huge and powerful subject matter. I love this idea that each life can be conceived of as an epic, but it's true that she was exposed to particularly tumultuous times. Yes. It might be a bit early in the discussion to, to come into this, but how political do you think her work is? You mentioned that she was engaged with the Communist Party. Yes. Do you think that emerges at all in this story? I'm not sure that this story is explicitly communist, though I would say that it is explicitly anti-war and anti-Nazi, anti-fascist perhaps. She is said to have been the writer who produced more work about the Holocaust than any other. And she was also described as the greatest woman writer that the GDR ever produced. I think 
there's a sense in which writing fiction and writing the novel in particular has been about writing humanity into its social context. No one is isolated. We're all of us involved in the political and social changes that we live through. And the novel has captured that often very well. So if you live through this period of dramatic crisis and world war, then it's kind of hard to avoid that. But also she was friends with some of the biggest political thinkers of the day, very good friends with George Lukács, for instance, and Walter Benjamin, and with movements that were explicitly looking for different artistic ways of describing the world, conveying what was happening with the world, movements that considered social realism to be inadequate and bourgeois. If you consider a novel like Middlemark by George Eliot, you may not have done. I'm trying to remember if I was made to read it at school. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the great realist novels, and I do actually, you know, think it's a marvellous novel, but it's its subtitle is A Study of a Provincial Town, and it takes the lives of certain people through a two and a half year span in that town and their personal crises, but also that kind of context of a town at a moment of change. Jane Eyre, I don't know if you've read Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre, I've read. I read that first when I was a child and I remember being seduced into thinking I was reading about 10 years of this writer's life. She starts when she's about 10, it finishes with her marriage when she's about 19 or 20 and you're seduced into believing that you're going along that journey with her whereas in fact obviously if you're writing the contents of 10 years down you're going to leave out many gaps. Social realism really disguises its own artistry it doesn't draw attention to it in that way. Someone like Proust it was one of the first to suggest that time isn't like that and you can't easily present 10 years of a person's life within the pages of a novel. This is perhaps an area where the short story really comes into its own, because I think it's true what you're saying about time, just that the level of lived experience will often experience a very intense moment quite slowly. Yes. And 10 years can pass without a single memory sometimes, very quickly. And I think the short story is perfect form for capturing moments. Um, and I think that's actually something that comes out in, in this story, Anna Sega's moment. But we have a, a sort of fracturing of moments, mm. it's not a single intense moment, but many moments uh, in the life of many, many characters, which is also um, unusual, isn't it? This is extraordinary. I mean, I don't know about you when you're writing your short stories, how you kind of light on a particular subject matter. But it's often, for me, as you were saying, it's around a moment of change rather than ex extracting the essence of a number of lives and taking you through perhaps 30 or 40 years, but you don't notice the passing of time. And so in a single paragraph, you might move from the girls being young to the end of their lives and then back again to that moment in which they're captured quite happily together. It's quite an incredible feat, isn't it? There's one that particularly struck me, a young man, Yes. And we see him both coming off a boat, I think. And yeah. at the same time, at the end of his life, both these moments kind of colliding. I suppose we get this in a more gentle way for, for people who've been lucky enough to have gentler lives. When we look at people who we've known for a long time, we might see them as a child, as a teenager, as an adult, if we've had a very long standing relationship with this person. And with these characters, we see very intense moments, but all colliding all in one go. So we see them in the bloom of youth and at the moment of their destruction or at the moment where they acted as heroes or the opposite. I know that's so incredibly intense, isn't it, to do it like that? No, it's very difficult, actually. Even though I said it's an extraordinary thing to choose a short story as a form for conveying so much, it's very difficult to imagine this as a novel. It works within the span of these pages, but 200 pages of that might be too much, you know. It might be. I must confess, I've read the story several times now. I still don't retain all the names of the characters because there are so many. It is truly epic in its breadth and it's uh, quite all-encompassing.
encompassing. There's not a single character that just put in there to fill space. You you get an insight into the the actions of each one. Well, I think that's right. And yet there probably is a certain amount of selection going on. I don't know what this school group was like, because we can assume it's an autobiographical story. She is referring to an actual class and an outing. I did read somewhere that it was an actual outing that she was writing about. In my classes, there were generally about 30 people. Possibly this school was shorter, uh, smaller. (laughs) But there is a kind of selection process going on there because maybe eight to 10 girls are mentioned. And then, as you rightly say, even though it's a dead girls class outing, there are these very moving stories of one or two men and boys and then men. You see them at the point in which they have the whole adult lives before them and then you see the end of their lives. Maybe for the benefit of people who haven't read the story we should talk a little bit about how it develops because she wrote this story actually in Mexico in 1943 to 44 so while the war was still on which is in itself I think you mentioned that extraordinary thing. It's it's remarkable especially since we get a feeling yeah so we get a feeling of hindsight as we read I think. You do. It's very much about that hindsight. She starts off in Mexico, although it's an interesting opening. The very first line seems to start in the middle of nowhere. No, from much farther away from Europe. That is the first line. So you're jolted into thinking, what what is this conversation? And then she goes on to say, the proprietor looks at her as if she said from the moon. And suddenly it seems just as weird to the narrator as it does to the proprietor that she should have come from Europe and ended up here in Mexico. So I think the opening sense is one of absolute displacement. And the narrator at this point is adult. Yeah, it's unsettling in many ways. And yet at the same time, for me, it was oddly familiar. As soon as I entered this space, I felt formal similarities with the Latin American landscapes that I'd met through other writers. Not not necessarily Mexican, not wanting to schmoosh all of Latin America together. Um, I'm aware that it's a huge But yeah, there's something that was, I think, my first impression that I was in Latin America. And I think it's not just to do with the the landscape that she evokes so so beautifully in in an almost painterly way, I I dare say. But there's also something of the like the desert vision or the vision quest about that opening paragraph, the, the feverishness and this feeling of being in the middle of nowhere. And then this sort of almost mirage-like apparition of the... Yeah, she's in a village which is surrounded like a fortress by a palisade of organ pipe cactus. So she doesn't just say cactus, she says organ pipe cactus. She's very specific about the details. So there is this odd combination of displacement, where am I, and absolute exactitude in terms of the details. I don't want to unsettle the details, but in my in my French copy, it's giant cacti. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know if that's a translation <laughs> that's of the species. I don't know enough about cacti. No, I think that's very... <laughs> but it's interesting, isn't it? Us. And no, yet I, I would say the image for me was the same. I did see the organ pie cacti. Oh, did you? So neither of us is reading this in the German, and that in itself is interesting. But yes, you picked up on the Latin American American influence very early on and I think it's probably true to say of Sagas that she had this unusually broad spectrum of artistic influences. We'll come back to the idea of painterly but she did her PhD dissertation into Rembrandt and chose the name Sagas. She was actually born as Nettie Ryling into a Jewish family. Chose the name Sagas from a 16th century painter Hercules for Sagas. So there's that sense of encompassing several artistic and literary traditions into her work as well. But yes, she's in this something she describes as a wild landscape like a lunar mountain range. And she mentions the proprietor in his large hat. She mentions the dog. The dog is very vivid, four legs covered in white dust. And yet the moment of transition, she starts to walk and suddenly she is in a different landscape and somebody is calling her earliest name, Nettie. 
society. Nobody has called her that for many years. Yeah, this is an interesting thing that you mentioned there, the transition. It seems to me that the transitions in the story often happen either on foot or by means of water. We, we either see her moving and at the end she speaks of a, a sense of uphill struggle and weakness in her yes. life. And then there are transitions between scenes that often take place um, by a sort of cut through shot and borrowing from film language but um, she seems to have shots of water as well we often look at the steamboat passing and the weight of the steamboat uh, and then there's the mist or fog that appears yes and there is something um, very filmic about this and of course she's writing at a time when film and photography are still kind of developing and there are certain filmic techniques or theatrical techniques almost so there are like particularly with film there's like fade in and fade out shots aren't they? extreme and then, close-ups yes yeah mm-hmm. and one of her novels the seventh cross was made into a film and i think she worked closely with the director i think she was very interested in film and what film could offer probably just very interested in visual media because as mm-hmm. well as being a film the seventh cross was made into a graphic novel an early example of a very political graphic novel so and you mentioned uh, walter benjamin and he he compares um, in his essay Art in the Age of Mechanical Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction Thank you <laughs> um, <laughs> but he compares painterly technique and then the techniques of a camera and this is something yeah I, I think it's interesting to consider with respect to Sega's work because it seems to fall into both categories somehow Yes I think you're right and that would make sense from someone who had studied art first of all as a PhD and then seems to have developed an interest in film and a kind of close association with film and radio play at one point yes so in a sense you have to see this short story don't you see the transition from a village in the desert in Mexico to this childhood scenario where the transition into a garden and the first thing she hears is the creaking of a seesaw and then she sees two close friends on that seesaw and they are was it Laney and and Maria? Yeah. Yes. I think because it started with a um, seesaw, I at first thought that the girls were, were younger than they were. I mean, how old did you think they were? There are lots of references to, to breasts and to hair as indicators of age. Aren't there? We seem to see certain characters both having dark hair of their youth and the white hair of old age. And yes. then... Yes, breasts often used to indicate either early early adolescence, I suppose, or, or young womanhood. And for the girls, I understood them to be early adolescent. I think when I, and when I read it again, it's clear that they're not quite all of the same age. Maybe one of those class groups where uh, there are two or three years between the oldest and the youngest member, because Laura is the oldest, and I think is it Ilsa or Elsa is the youngest. But also, yes, that sense of the hair in braids, like that for the very young ones but also touches of grey in it it's like there is reference to more than one age at the same time as if the person as drawn up contains all the full potential of their life and death in this portrayal um, she also uses little visual indicators to link the characters to their acts. And for me, it seemed to keep coming back to what the characters had done, not so much who they were, perhaps, because the characterization, I think you picked up on this very early on, it seems to be not, not so much shallow, but quite lightly done. We don't really learn that much about who each person is, but we do learn what they've done. That We see Marianne, for example, with the carnation her, between her teeth, with her friends then also when she's denouncing her friend and then when she's lying dead herself as a result of the bombings and so there's something slightly it's a bit like the repetition of trauma I think the way traumatic images can keep flashing up they're they're not so easily dismissed and I wondered if um, if it might be considered a psychological story in that sense not so much in the sense of who these people are, but more in the sense of how we might manage to deal with such a heavy legacy, how, how people are meant to move forward after a huge, a huge trauma such as, well, not just one war, but, but several. I think there is a quote that I can't quite think where it comes from, but it's something like a person who dies at 32 is at all stages of their life, somebody who dies at 32. It's like what just happened and the moment of their deaths do define the way we look 
at them. So you, you see them first as uh, young girls full of expectation, full of affection for one another, quite playful. And then you have the story of the terrible thing that has happened. So in Marianne's case, she has betrayed Lainey, her best friend. Lainey has died of hunger in a concentration camp. Her daughter has been taken away from her. Marianne, who is the prettiest, has, I think, made a good marriage in certain terms, but is blown apart by a bomb. And then you go back to the garden scene and then you cannot read it the same way. And the debit is quite controlled. The, the full story isn't revealed in one go. It just keeps popping up and popping up and popping up with a sort of relentlessness. So, yes. we, so we ourselves then see all of these moments when we when the characters pop up. Yes, I think so, there is that relentlessness. Yeah. and um, accumulation of intensity very intensing to see to have almost the essence of a person's life extracted or condensed to the moment of the outing and then the moment as you say of destruction the moment when they either wreak their own destruction or wreak it on somebody else the, the kind of dramatic turning point so there is one of the girls who is particularly fond of her teacher mm-hmm. Miss Seichel that in the next paragraph we learn that she has driven her from a bench on which Jewish women are not allowed to speak and has spat at her on the street because she's been called her a Jewish sound. Yeah, so the insults they as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. very shocking. And I find this fascinating also because short story writers are often told to write so that there's a sense of inevitability about the ending. But we, I don't think we ever get that with this story. It's, it's as if she's trying to open up possibility all the time at the same time as closing it. She seems to be trying to open up uh, the sense that something different might have happened for each of these people. Things might have been different. Uh, there was a quote from her in, um, I think it was in the English version, where she says, when you write, she must write so that the opportunity can be sensed behind the despair and the escape behind the downfall. And I think that comes through all the time in this story. She seems to be asking um, how how people end up how they do, what makes them do what they do, and mm. both condemning, because I think the judgments are quite clear, but yes. also always looking for how it might have been different. Okay, I haven't really thought of that. And I'm thinking about it now because, as you say, the, the sense of judgment is very strong, really. And we can't help but judge along with her, I think, that. Um, although mainly my sense is of the tragedy of it all, really, that people who loved one another turned on one another and destroyed one another's lives. And another one who kind of haunted me to some extent was the one who married someone and their husband had to hang out a flag for the um, the Nazis. And when she saw the flag, she just committed suicide. There are actually no good endings in this, but mm. you're saying that you see presenting the opportunity for there to have been a better outcome uh, well I don't know if we really get the full uh, sense of things that things could have been different but it's yeah there's something about seeing everybody as a young person full of, full yes, of, life full of love they're not they're inherently they're, evil I yes I was just about to say that there, there is no sense in there that any of these people is inherently evil they're just caught up in cataclysmic events world changing events to some extent extent they are powerless in those events and yet they each react differently to them don't they they certainly don't mm-hmm. all there is resistance from some of them they mm-hmm. might all be doomed but some of them are complicit with the events some of them take on board the whole national socialism do- um, doctrine others are horrified by it so there are this range of responses as you say there's not an examination of why some people responded differently there's no sense of it being written into their fate or their upbringing it's um in their youth there is all this different potential that turns out tragically at the end but i think it turns out tragically because of the larger forces that they're all caught up in and perhaps it's just the question that keeps recurring whether it could have been different i was speaking to um, a psychology undergraduate about the story oh, trying yes. to better understand it from that point of view and they pointed out to me that the war to a large extent 
instinct kick-started the field of social psychology. There were experiments that followed, such as the Milgram experiment and the Robbers Cave study. Um, I think the Milgram experiment coincided with the trial of Adolf uh, Eichmann. Ah. And I understand that part of the, the combustion for this was perhaps the same questions, why, why people do what they do, how they turn out, the way they turn out. So perhaps it's you know, the question that is recurrent in this work. What's the experiment that you're talking about? Is it that one where they test whether people will inflict pain on other human beings? I understand that it's been sort of not exactly discredited, but I, mean, I certainly wouldn't get an ethics sign off these days. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, the Milgram experiment, I think they put uh, somebody in a position where they were following orders, which yes. resulted in what they would have perceived as pain for another yeah. person. And then the Robbers Cave study was a little bit like... Um, uh, what's that Charles story? I'm glad to have you opposite for this question. Where the uh, Lord of the Flies, well, I found it. <laughs> Thank you. It was more or less that, but uh, in an experiment journey. I think that was uh, 1954, the other 1960. Yes, this makes a lot of sense because, in one sense, there's this great drive to understand what in older language we would term as evil. But since the war itself shook up religious perceptions of the world. It becomes much more of a psychological question. What drives someone to be utterly destructive of other human beings? And what drives another person, I suppose, to, to attempt to help them? That sounds very simplistic in that we both have both drives, I would think. But yes, nobody's come up with a very adequate explanation of that. Whereas in, you know, medieval and perhaps a bit later terminology, it would just have been the devil. It's a convenient explanation. So yes, I suppose you're right in saying that this story kind of presents the problem, the question, without necessarily offering an answer. And it achieves its effect partially through this collapsing of time frames and locations. I found it very moving when the narrator actually sees her own mother and she says she would be older than her mother was then. Yeah, an incredibly moving moment, isn't it? Yeah. And she says at the beginning that the only journey that interests her is the journey home. And yet even in fiction, she can't reach her mother's arms. That's right. And that's why <laughs> the story is at least partly about exile, isn't it? You know, uh, the narrator is exiled in more ways than one from the events that she is describing. Yes. Profoundly it's exiled in, in space, time, time and really, space. in so many ways. And by knowledge in a way, isn't she? You know, imagine loss of innocence. And knowing how their life, what the outcome of their life is. There is a nightmarish quality to that. I mean, I think you mentioned the idea of requiem and elegy, and I think that is very powerful in here, but there is also that slightly nightmarish sense of what is unfolding. It's certainly something dreamlike. I don't know if I had the nightmarish sense of something unfolding. I think for me, I felt almost as if the dust was already settling and that mm -hmm. she was holding a mirror up to, to society in a way, which is extraordinary given the date of the, the story. Yes, I mean, I think you're right to mention that, that the war hasn't finished and yet there is all this hindsight. Mm -hmm. And maybe because we know how the war turned out, but there does seem to me to be a sense of doom in it, that what is happening is not told from the perspective of victory, it's told from the perspective of loss and tragedy. While people struggle to know the future, even on the sense of the weather forecast, we've always, as a the human race has struggled to know the future. There are very good reasons why we don't know the future, aren't there? You know, we don't know <laughs> when we're 11 that we might die at 46 or we don't know the manner of our death and there's a very good reason for that. The cover of this is a very interesting one. I don't know if you've got the same cover. Yeah. Almost a kind of supernatural sense of knowledge, the angel in the Garden of Eden. Did you find it an emotional story? Mm, that's a very good question. It's certainly very shocking, but there is something about the breath that prevents you from going deep. And I think this comes back to the thing about it being slightly painterly, because it does feel very much like a landscape painting. You're going across 
And you yeah. feel like you're going in because you've got these extreme close-ups and these pop-out details. But it is a little bit like a Dutch landscape in the for all the finely rendered detail, the play is over the surface somehow. You know, you never you're never plunging the depths in a way. It, it seems to keep popping out instead. It's very interesting that because I think like you'll say because was a landscape painter and. <laughs> Also, maybe like those uh, medieval depictions of humanity by Bruegels or who was the other one, Bosch, that said something about the life of man and particularly the damnation of man. But you don't see the individual in that kind of close, intimate detail. So these girls are individuals, but something about seeing them in summation, as you say, prevents you from really living with them as characters. And I think one of the critics said of the story that you have to engage with the larger narrative rather than the individual narrative and I think that's true and for that reason as well it's unusual as a short story it is yeah perhaps a little like the Sheila Armstrong one I think there too you have to engage with the larger narrative perhaps yeah there are perhaps similarities yeah, certainly in the the density the richness of detail so, I mean, we, we have in the past considered how you might write a story like this one. And with this particular case, I find it quite difficult to answer. I think you have to have the very large subject matter. It might work if you were considering mortality or mutability. But increasingly, I think it's a sense of epic crisis that informs this, that all these lives are going towards a particular end. And the intensity is generated by the extreme so circumstances in which they live and die. It's not an allegory and it's not social realism. In many ways it's a really unusual short story in terms of its scope and its technique. It's a remarkable story in so many ways. Yeah, such a lot to learn from it. I think you could study it for a long time and not exhaust it. Just to recap, it was published in a collection of the same name, The Dead Girls Class Trip, by New York Review Books in May 2021. Do follow it up. It's an extraordinary story. So once again, thank you for listening to the Small Pleasures podcast. And do keep your eyes and ears open for our next Watch This Space. We have many great stories to cover. Until then, goodbye from me and Sonia. A très bientôt.